Hey everybody, it's Lisa from True North Home School Academy. I'm here today with Father Wesley Walker from the East Coast. It's probably hot and muggy there, I would assume. Very hot, very muggy. Yeah. yeah. We're like hot, but we had rain all weekend, which is crazy great for us. In the summer, we don't get so much. So you've had a big week. You just uh, bought a car, celebrated a big anniversary. You're smiling. It must have been a good week. <laughs> it was a good week. It was a good week. Yes, it uh, was a hectic week, but one of those weeks where you could see God moving in our lives. And it was a uh, it was a good, and it ended up being a very good week. Yeah, we've awesome. been married for 10 years. Hard to believe. Wow, congratulations. That's Thank you. so great. I think you're younger than some of my kids. So 10 years is like a long time, right? <laughs> well, when, when we were first married, you know, I was too young to buy alcohol. So <laughs> put that in context. <laughs> okay, that makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> well, congratulations to you and your wife. Thank you. Um, you have a clerical collar on. So you are an Anglican priest, for those of you guys who are not familiar with Father Walker. And you've been teaching for True North, I think for like four or five years, right? I think it has been about four years. I think yeah. during COVID is probably when I first uh, started teaching, I think 2020. Okay. Um, and th I vaguely remember that. That whole era feels like a blur, but um, I, I think know. that's when we started. So it's it's been a few years. Yeah. It's been a few years. I love it. You have been teaching Latin, kind of classical studies. You've taught um, Latin. This year you're doing Latin two, three, and four. Um, you are doing informal and formal logic. And um, those are such great classes. I honestly, I think everybody should take them, whether you're a classical educator or not, because they teach you how to think yes. um, and how to balance a lot of things at once. So how you were classically educated. Tell us a little bit about your background and why you still love the classics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I was raised, uh, I was homeschooled uh, all the way from kindergarten through graduating high school. Uh, we were classically educated, so took Latin and read the great books, etc. Um, and really, uh, at the time, I don't think I appreciated it nearly as much as I did later. But it didn't take me long after leaving and, and going to college that I did begin to, to realize, okay, there is something to this. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some of that was just being in context where, um, you know, you could see in the classroom other students from different backgrounds. And of course, there are people who are brilliant and who are good students from all sorts of backgrounds. But right. just in general, the kind of study habits and the experiences that they had been given uh, seemed to show that there were some deficiencies there. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, yeah, I began to, to very greatly appreciate uh, what was what I had been raised with in terms of classical education. And um, I had the opportunity to teach some homeschool students uh, when I was graduating undergrad and starting seminary. Uh, and actually, a funny fact, that was probably what, six, seven years ago now, eight, maybe, maybe more than eight years ago now. And one of the student, one of the group of students that I just taught are coming to stay with us next month or next oh, week, uh, because we've kept in touch all these years. And so it's been really cool to see them grow up and all that. So uh, anyway, so I, I did that. And then I, um, when my wife got pregnant with our first son, mm -hmm. um, I got a job teaching Latin at a classical Christian school in Roanoke, Virginia, worked there for a few years, really loved it, loved the environment and the atmosphere and the working with students every day and all that. And then we, um, I got called to be the, a full-time pastor mm -hmm. here in Annapolis, Maryland. Yeah. And so I took my parish, but I still had that itch for the classroom. And so True North came across my, I think, Facebook feed. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't really very familiar with it, but saw it and thought, wow, this looks like a good opportunity to kind of get the scratch the itch of being in the classroom. And of course, this was right before COVID. I think it was yeah. before COVID that maybe we had first made contact. Yeah. And um, so anyway, so it's just been a really wonderful opportunity to do that. And the classics very much inform what I do in terms of just parenting, in terms of, uh, of being a pastor at a church, in terms of teaching. Um, I have a podcast that we started about a year ago now called The Classical Mind, where we talk about great books in the Western canon. So mm -hmm. it really is the water in which I swim, you know, and, I, and yeah. I wouldn't have it any other way. I love it. You have two little boys now. Yeah, five and two. Wow. And and OK, so are, is it hockey games or baseball or both? Well, or both. Baseball? We're a big sports family. I my dad and I, that's how we always bonded growing up. And I played baseball, basketball soccer football growing up um and uh still love all those sports and so um we became baltimore orioles fans when we moved up here to where we live because we're very, really not far from baltimore it's about 30 minute drive 
And so we adopted them. This was when they were really, really bad. And now they're really, really good. So we've been going to more games lately. But um, but we are probably the biggest Carolina Hurricanes hockey fans. Okay. Um, my son got to go to his first game. We still have our family down in Raleigh. So we went to see them around Christmas. And we went to, took him to his first game, which he had a blast at. And we are all we watch almost every game on TV. So, yeah, that's uh, that's something that we love. And we can ground that in the classics too, right? Play-Doh in the gymnasium or something like that. So um, that's my justification anyways. Oh my gosh. You have the cutest little boys. They are so adorable, honestly. Yep. And um, so we have a really good friend. He's a rabbi. He is so classically trained. He has a podcast called the, the baseball rabbi or something. Oh, um, and he's so into the stats of it. I mean, he can tell you every stat about every player and how it all goes together. And it is crazy. He's just so he's such a geek. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's a beautiful game. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm always kind of like, you know, when you get to a certain level, it's almost like, okay, like who is, who's going to win? Does it matter? They're just so good, you know? <laughs> yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So you, uh, and I think this is so funny. Tamara Poole, who's other, who's our other serious classicist on, on board at True North, you guys have been talking and she was going to teach the logics this year, but now you're going to teach them and you've taught informal and formal logic for a few years. And again, I, here's my apologetic for la for logic. Look, you guys, your kids are going to hit junior high and they're going to start arguing with you. It's just going to be part of who they are. So teach them how to argue well. <laughs> so everybody should take logic because the other thing, the other thing I love about logic is it teaches your kids how to not be taken in by everything. Like they're able to, it just kind of starts that uh, discernment where they can start realizing like, well, that's a fallacy or that doesn't really make sense or that doesn't follow this or it might be valid, but it's not true. And they learn all that in both informal and formal logic. So tell us a little bit about how you run the logic classes. You've done yeah. it for a couple years. Yeah. Yeah. I think pretty much since I started. Yeah teaching i've taught all, all of these classes so they've had a few years to marinate and yeah. get even better hopefully than they were yeah. the first go round um informal logic so so you're right exactly right logic is important because it teaches us how to think and how we think is important on two levels there's the sort of external aspect of that being able to communicate what it is we believe and why which yes. is so important but then there's a kind of internal aspect to that too which is that you know it's possible to believe the right thing for the wrong reasons and when we even so in, in those cases where we may reach a right conclusion, but we do so for the wrong in the wrong way, wow. that can really impact us negatively, I think. Um, and so it's really important for students to learn both how to engage in a positive way where they're not just shutting down uh, other people's arguments where they do actually want to listen and hear what other people have to say while also not, you know, leaving their brain at the door or something like that. So we do this in a couple ways. So informal logic begins with a semester pretty much only on logical fallacies. That is the what not to do. Yeah. And it's important for students to be able to maybe recognize where they themselves tend to commit logical fallacies, but also to be able to recognize when others commit logical fallacies as well. So the, they're learning the basic rules of the game. Hey, you can't do that. You can't do this. You have to operate in these parameters. The second part of informal logic, the second semester, really, uh, really plays into how to make an argument well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just what not to do, but what you actually should do. And we do this by uh, using the argument builder textbook, which mm -hmm. uh, talks about the common topics, mm -hmm. definition, relationship, mm -hmm. circumstance, testimony, et cetera. Yeah. And mm -hmm. those are really key in learning how to build a case. And so what you find is that logic is a portable skill. Mm -hmm. It's not just a logic class, but this is teaching your students to think in a way that will help them when they're doing math, when yes. they're doing English, when they're writing papers, when they're giving speeches, when they're doing debate. Mm -hmm. Any area can benefit from a student having taken logic. So yeah. that's what we do in informal logic. Yeah. In formal logic, there are some overlapping emphases. For example, we we do do a brief study on the fallacies, though that's not quite as um, thorough as the informal logic one. Um, we use Peter Kreft's book, Socratic Logic, mm -hmm. where they learn maybe more about how to make the argument rather than what the argument actually says. So mm -hmm. it's in some ways, formal logic is a little more like algebra. You know, um, mm -hmm. uh, there can be right and wrong answers, whereas in informal logic, it's really more about the strength of an argument versus the yeah. weakness of an argument. Mm -hmm. um, and so they learn they learn about deduction rather than induction, more informal mm -hmm. logic. Um, but I really love the Kreft book. He is yeah. quite a 
thinker. He's amazing. And yes, so he is. Yeah. He's a great he's a great example for our students of someone that we would want them to emulate. But also he um he he does a good job of drawing in a bunch of examples from all sorts of uh, all sorts of other uh places you know I, I in fact i just uh finished reading brothers karamazov and i remember he uses a specific line in the novel that uh for an example in one of the one of the exercises you know and i thought oh that's that's that line that peter Kreft uses so it's really cool the way he does all that brings it together because that's really at the heart of a classical education is that these subjects aren't always distinct from each other you know so right. how yep. they how they do deduction and and structuring an argument goes into their reading of scripture goes into their reading of novels everything is connected yeah i love that i i, I mean i just I, I love the five common topics that was something we really camped on in our home and we use them all the time my daughter was actually just she did an internship um this summer where it was a group of high school students that went to washington dc for a ministry and she was going through the five common topics with them and um, somebody asked her, like, are you a trained teacher? How do you know this stuff? And she's like, I'm in college. <laughs> I'm just a kid. <laughs> but once you get a hold of them, they're such a great tool to use for so many different kind of situations. And the other thing about formal logic, we, we were doing formal logic in our home while we were doing a study of um, Paul's writings in the mm. New Testament. He is a master logician and he really uses a lot of formal logic. And that was one thing that was super fun for us to go. You know, he he led this pagan world to the cross through the use of actually formal logic. I mean, yeah. so it's really a powerful tool. I just think everybody should um, take it, especially those of you who are coming from a faith point of view, because um, there's so much emotion wrapped up in arguments right now of who's right, who's wrong. And when you can just distill it down to logic, it just takes the emotion out of it. And um, it's just a better way, to, <laughs> better way to prove your point, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you're you're 100 percent correct about St. Paul being a master logician. I think St. Paul was so uh, he was so brilliant, you know, and he, he but he certainly would have been familiar, I think, with with the writings of, of Aristotle, for example, which is where we get a lot of our logic from, you know, so he, he had all these tools and was able to really on a dime switch the way that he engaged with people. I mean, you even read the way he goes into a city and he would go to the synagogue first until they kicked him out. And then immediately he goes to the, to the Greeks, you know? Yes. And so I just imagine having to navigate those different cultural waters so quickly, yeah. but his, his ability to engage either of those audience doesn't seem like one was better than the other or weaker than the other. Mm -hmm. He was able to meet them kind of on their own terms yeah. and use their own tools. I mean, my favorite, one of my favorite passages is Acts 17, where he starts quoting the pagan poets at the pagan philosophers. Yeah. Your own poets have said, in him we live and move and have our being. Yeah, yeah, that that's a great example. Um, Okay. Well, I love logic. I think, I mean, I'm not really great at teaching formal logic, but I do love it and I appreciate it so much. And even if your kids, if at the end of a logic class, they don't feel like, Hey, I can teach this. We've had some kids go through the logic class twice, especially the formal logic, because it is, it is a discipline. I mean, it is, uh, you just really have to, to work at it, but most kids find it to be a really satisfying and fun game. Um, and they start really appreciating like, wow, I can really make arguments with this and um, and strategize how I'm getting what I need and want from from parents even. <laughs> yes. oh, absolutely. And I do think it's, a, it's, again, one of those things that overlaps a lot with math. It's important that we study math, even if you have no desire to be an engineer or a, or a mathematician of some sort, because yeah. when you study math, you learn right order of things mm -hmm. and numbers and ideas. Yeah. And right. formal yeah. logic does that very similarly, you know? So, I mean, you do have to plot out an argument. If S, then P, P, yeah. then S, you know, is that a valid or an invalid argument and why? Yeah. Um, what does it mean um, for, a, for a proposition to be an A proposition or an O prop? So you have to learn how to think abstractly and, and reasonably, but that's what's really important for us because that's part of what being made in the image of God means is that we're reasonable, rational creatures. And so yes. we harness those powers that were given, yeah. been given by God. Exactly. And, and again, just coming from a faith perspective, it helps your kids understand apologetics for why they believe. And that's more important than ever before. I just, I was reminded of this statistic this weekend when we did our retreat, um, BJ pointed out, you know, 70% of American Christian kids are going to college and by Thanksgiving, 
they have renounced their faith in the God of the Bible. Mm. And I think they just get hit with stuff they don't have a refutation for. And logic helps them like have a response to some of the stuff that's coming at them and they can stand with feet firmly planted. So I think it's super, it's not only an intellectual pursuit, but it can really help kids own and understand their own faith in a way that they're not as swayed by, by the many voices that are just rushing at them in, in this, in these crazy times. <laughs> yes. Right. Well, and that's one of the beauties of homeschooling and, and classical schools and everything is that we don't see this just as a place to put information in the heads of our students, but rather we want our students to learn virtue, which yes. is the right ordering of the soul or the ordering right. of the soul towards a good thing. And so, um, you know, in formal logic class, we certainly touch on all of these points and we do talk about apologetics and stuff, but even just the, the act of that right ordering is a kind of movement towards the good and the intellectual virtues, you know? So it's so important for them to be well-rounded because they're human beings. They're not just brains on sticks. We and want they, them to and, be fully, right, right. fully and developed. It, you know, I think it, it, whether you are classically educated or not, this is one of those, in my opinion, must have classes for your kids. Um, it's a great class to outsource because uh, when I taught it, I, I wasn't versed in formal logic and it was really actually a stress because um, you were learning it. You know, I was learning it while I was teaching it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so outsourcing this to somebody who gets it and loves it uh, like, and you really do. And that makes all the difference because you bring that enthusiasm and you're not fumbling around looking for what page you are on. Like I tend to do when well, I'm teaching something. I don't know. <laughs> in theory, I shouldn't be, but we'll see. In theory. Well, I mean, there's always the new edition, right? <laughs> there is a new edition, I think, of uh, some, one of the informal yeah, aspects, I think. I think there was too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad you're teaching these classes. I love that we offer them. Informal logic, honestly, until this year, it was always the first class to fill for us. Hmm. So um, that class is actually getting more full. And so if you guys, if you want this day and time, um, you know, enroll today, because I don't know that we're going to be uh, offering a second section of it this year. Um, and you are also teaching Latin two, three, and four. And um, you've done that for several years. I love the fact that we teach Latin. Um, I think it's a great foundational language because it teaches your kids not only how to think and critical thinking skills, but how to manage a lot of things at once. So also executive functioning skills. And this is a great foundational language because if they can learn how to learn Latin, they can learn any other language, in my opinion, um, just because there's so many moving parts with Latin. <laughs> but um, I love Latin um, and, and I'm so glad you're teaching it, especially after Latin one. And Tamara's doing Latin one this year. So we've got a great uh, lineup of Latin teachers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Latin is a fantastic. It's such an underrated language. And, you know, sometimes initially it's the tough sell of yeah. all the languages well it's a dead language is one yeah. you hear a lot and i always say well it's just sleeping we have to wake it up yeah. um but but it is important i mean we stand in a tradition both as christians and as just american people in general who have benefited from thousands of years of a sort of roman greco-roman you know latin influenced yeah. uh culture and so it's really important for us to understand that where we come from. I mean, you go and look at monuments, you know, and you see all sorts of Latin yep. inscriptions and even on our money, there's Latin inscriptions. And so what does that mean? And and what is the kind of universe in which those things came out of? And, uh, you know, even if you can read E Pluribus Unum or something like that, uh, where does that come from? And so right. these are the kinds of things that we work on. It's, you know, primarily we're learning language, but there's also a lot of sort of cultural you yeah. know, uh, references in our books that that help the students understand a little bit about just how significant that Latin tradition was and in, in where we are today. Right. So significant that there are 15,000 anglicized words that are from Latin origins that we speak daily. So when I was teaching Latin, I always started it off by saying to the kids, you're already speaking Latin. You just don't even know it. That's and I think that kind of takes some of the sting out of it for some of the students. Like, you know more Latin than you think just by speaking English. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, but the cultural part of it, too, is so very important, I think. Um, and this year, Tamara is teaching the ancient um, ancient Roman and NLE test prep as a one credit class um, to go with any of the Latin classes. It's an exceptional class. Tamara's really a classicist, too. Mm -hmm. And she just brings so much to the table. But that's a really fun class. I, I love these classes. To me, 
um, ancient history is one of the most exciting um, historical eras that you can study. Um, and so much of our world is based on it even now, um, you know, centuries later. So it's really a fun, if you have a history lover, put them in Latin. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. I was even reminded of this this morning because my church, we're doing a study on Dante's comedy in the fall. Mm -hmm. And so I was getting ready for it and I was going through one of the cantos and you look at the names that he lists of all these people. I think that it's in limbo. They're going in the first circle yeah. and, um, and there he lists like 20 names back to back. And it's like, oh, you would learn that person if you took Latin. You would learn that person if you took Latin. You would know who that is if you took Latin. I mean, so many of them, because that's just, that's how pervasive it was. And so you think about how influential the comedy is. I mean, even for people who may not subscribe to all of its finer theological points, it's still in terms of imagination, something that yeah. has so shaped the milieu in which we yeah. are swim. And so then you think about, well, who influenced the yeah. author of this work, well, all these great Roman uh, yeah. writers. So yeah. there's so much there. It's such a rich language. It's mm -hmm. so fun to be able to pick up the the Latin Vulgate or a church father or a Roman poet or someone and just be able to read it. I mean, that's such a rewarding experience, I think, for a student. And it's something that I try and do as much as possible. Bring in some primary texts, you know, bring in a couple oh. Bible verses and let's look at it in Latin. Bring in a couple lines from a poem. Bring in, there's a number of works that have been translated into Latin that are more modern, like the Hobbit has been translated into Latin yeah. or Winnie the Pooh has been translated into yeah. Latin. And so we will sometimes look at those just for fun on days when we don't have as, as much going on. And so it's a, it's a blast. I love it. I love it. Yeah. The students love it too. You've had, so we've had several students go all the way through Latin four with you. Um, some of them started in fifth grade with Latin one and they successfully went through Latin four. I think before they hit high school, they had four years of Latin credit and then they jumped into a modern language and the modern languages, especially if they're romance languages, they don't even break a sweat when they go do that. And we've had several kids who are doing a second language while they're studying Latin at the same time at True North. And they're not stressed by it. They just think it's a fun puzzle. Um, it, my son used to say Latin is just like Legos with language. Um, you just have to figure out where to put all the blocks and organize them and then just put them together. And it's just a blast. So um, yeah, he really, uh, although he's glad he's not teaching it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. So he graduated from college and now he has an actual job. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, so you guys, if you have any questions about Latin or about um, the formal or informal logic, uh, Father Walker's also taught several um, Bible classes for us. I don't think you are this year. Um, you're kind of maxed out with some other things you have going on in, in, in your day job kind of life because right. you do work full time. Um, and um, we'll, we might bring those back, but we do have some other Bible classes if you're interested. But again, if you guys have any questions about the formal or informal logic or Latin, Feel free to drop a comment here or head on over to the Homeschool Looks Like Tribe. And if, if uh, Father Walker doesn't see it, I'll pass the message on along to him. We've had several people ask about classes as they're transferring from one school to maybe homeschool or to an online program. Where does my student fit in? And if I can't help you with the placement, I will, I will get you um, in touch with the teacher because in my opinion, Placement is so key to success and so many things with education. So that's we're not interested in just selling you the class and leaving you out to hang. We want to make sure that your kids get into the right place and that they can really succeed. That that just brings us so much joy um, to come alongside you and your family and just see your kids wildly successful with what they're studying. That's that's our happy place at True North. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. Anything else you want to tell everybody before? I mean, I hate to say it's the end of summer. That like just makes me sad. <laughs> uh, 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 yes. It, it, it feels like it has just flown by. I was so looking forward to this summer and <laughs> ended up just every little thing, you know, was it piled up and it, yeah, wasn't much of a break, but that's not a bad thing. It's just, um, the reality of it, you know? Yeah. Um, no, I don't, I don't think I have a ton to add other than that. I'm just very excited about this school year again. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing students who have, have been in true North before, but I'm also looking forward to making new connections and seeing new meeting new uh, students and, and working with them. And can't wait to see them flourish as both as uh, intellectuals, but also as human beings. As human beings. Yeah, that's a great way to end. Well, thanks. Um, great to talk to you. And uh, I hope you're in air conditioning. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. And in fact, I have a window unit right off to the side. So I'm, yeah, I'm cool. Point. 
<laughs> That's awesome. Okay. You guys, if you have any questions, let us know. And we'll be back this week with more Meet the Teachers. Rachel Margion's coming and she's a French gal. Um, so more great language stuff coming your way. Father Walker, thanks so much. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Thanks. Okay. Bye, everybody.